behold. The 1915 Fryer Story and Clark something whatever. Uh, Universal Toaster. Story and Clark makes pianos, not toasters. Anyway. Okay. So this is uh, a toaster that I just kind of... I wouldn't... I won't call it a restoration. I'd call it a repair job. I just repaired it. I got it, I got it to a point where it's actually, you know, s somewhat safe to use. Um, it's actually on right now, uh, <laughs> if you can believe that. It's generating all kinds of sorts of heat. Uh, I guess I can unplug it now. Okay, so what am I going to talk about? Now, this toaster, as I said, I didn't restore it. I repaired it. Um, with some things, restoring it would involve um you know way more cost than it's worth i can buy to i can buy one of these in better shape um that doesn't need restoration for what i would actually have to put into it and we're talking a complete uh replating job um you know it, we're talking a lot of work here replating it um the, the mica uh, insulators are in good shape the elements are in good shape um, it's all there it's not missing any parts um, but it does have a makeshift spring on the other side for the door, and show you what that looks like. This is actually kind of the uh, the after video, but we're going to put it in first. Uh, this spring right here, you can take a look at that. I'll zoom in on it. It's really not the right spring. It's like a mangled pen spring that's in there. Um, that was probably repaired, you know, could 50 years ago. God only knows. Um, it's been apart before. Uh, it has all the symptoms and signs of a few hack repair jobs over the years. Um, you can tell by the feet. Uh, one of them is actually just a disc of rubber, and the others are no longer flexible. They may have been rubber at some point, but they're not anymore. This toaster is approximately 90 to 100 years old. It could be anywhere from 1915 to about 1925, but it's hard to say, and I'm hoping some of you toaster experts can tell me, uh, because this one, it's still actually kind of hot, so I don't want to touch it too much, but it has an embossed plate on the bottom side there. And uh, it's actually made by... Doo -doo -doo, Landers, Frary, and Clark, New Britain, Connecticut. Now... The toasters that are like this one, the same model, this is an E945, they appear to have a couple of different changes. Now, the ones that I've seen on eBay generally have um, a label on the bottom rather than an embossed plate. So I'm not sure when that was changed. I would imagine that the embossed plate would have been an earlier model. But here's what confuses me. I've seen some of these online that have coil elements, which I believe predate the mica and um, uh, flat nichrome wire elements that we see here. It was pointed out to me in a previous video that this toaster draws something like 350 watts. Um, and I did a comparison video, I'm sure you've, if you're watching this you've seen this, I did a video called The Great Toaster Race where I compared this 300 some odd watt toaster to a modern day to slice uh, 900 watt toaster and this one actually beat the pants off of that other toaster not only did it use less energy um, but it also toasted faster even with manually flipping the bread I, I was blown away by that one um, now this thing is dangerous as all get up I mean, there like I said it isn't the most dangerous appliance you can own um, but it is one of the most dangerous for a couple of reasons. It has absolutely no thermal protection whatsoever. If you're making toast on this thing and you touch any part of it other than the handle to open the, to flip the toast, you will burn yourself. And <laughs> it's going to hurt like hell. The top, actually the base doesn't get hot, but the top does. There's just no protection, no burn protection. Um, the fact that you have to manually flip the bread over when you're done, or when it's done on one side, um, you know, it forces you to touch the appliance when it's in use. Um, aside from electrical concerns, like this cord is something awful. Um, <laughs> you know, this is probably not the original cord. I, I don't know for sure. 
this is this plug I think would be similar to what you would find originally on this appliance. It is a Bakelite plug. Uh, it is a dangerous plug. Um, if you were to touch this while it's plugged in, like put your finger right there, you would be shocked. Um, you know, it's just not a very safe design. Uh, the cord, oh, I mean, the cord is obviously, you know, it's <laughs> it doesn't get much more dangerous than that. Uh, but yeah, the cord is shit house um, that has to be replaced uh, to use this appliance. The plug on the other end. Just your typical replacement style plug from the night I would say from the 1930s or 40s. I don't believe this is from 1915. Um, in fact, the entire cord may be newer than the toaster. It's hard to really tell. A lot of them did use the same type of plug, so put that aside for now. What else can I tell you about it? I found a couple of advertisements for this toaster um, on old in old publications and magazines. And that's how I determined the age from 1915 to about 1925. Um, although I think this may be one of the earlier ones because of its metal plate on the bottom. Um, so uh, it now here's what really interests me. It was originally plated. I mean, it still got the original plating, but it was plated in either nickel or silver. That was what the two options were for this model: nickel or silver. Um, chrome, uh, it looks more like chrome to me, uh, because nickel, I believe, has more of a satin finish to it. Uh, but this had a bright finish until I ruined it. Let's talk about that. Later in this video, you're going to see where I attempted to polish the chrome using steel wool and metal polish, which I have used before. And it actually has come recommended on a couple of different sites and a couple of different people I've spoken to over the years that actually would poly they would polish chrome with you know uh, zero quadruple zero steel wool which is very fine and metal polish now or WD-40 people use it on their motorcycles I, I know people that do this so I mean don't you know you can't blame me for doing what I think is right and I've done it on um, a microphone stand that I was I was working on I, it worked beautiful um, I've done it to Toasters worked great. I do it to this, not so great. So I'm wondering if maybe this was in fact plated in nickel and not chrome, because I believe chrome is a little bit harder than nickel. Harder wearing, anyway. Either way, what's done is done. At least it was on this toaster and not one that was in better condition. As you can see, the plating is completely worn off the top. I didn't polish the top. This actually came like this. And I just made the base match it, I guess. I gave it more of a satin appearance. I feel like an ass for doing that, but you know what? This is how we learn. In the future, I'll, I'll still use metal polish, but I won't use steel wool. I'll find something softer. Although I thought steel wool was one of the softest, but not enough. Uh, the, uh, the plating is ruined on the doors. It was like that when I got it. It's burned off on the inside of the doors, more than likely from being left plugged in for a long period of time. It does show signs of actually catching fire. If you look way up in there, um, there's a lot of what appears to be heat damage and, and more than likely from a bread fire. Uh, it was very ashy. When I took this top cover off, that it was like rusting and it was, it was gross. Um, so I replaced the, uh, the vertical stakes that hold the bread in place or keep the bread away from the elements. Originally, or when I got it, it was missing two, so it only had eight stakes in it. It requires ten. And those I had to make from uh, galvanized wire, which you'll see later on. As if you decide to watch the whole video, uh, you'll see how I did that. That was very easy to do. So, Future plans for this toaster, I'm not really sure. I'm not a toaster guy, really. Uh, I just thought it was neat. Um, but in all honesty, um, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I might throw it on eBay. Who knows? <laughs> um, yeah, it has a lot of chrome damage uh, or plating, whatever the hell it is. Nickel. It's not silver. I know it's not silver because silver uh, would have tarnished and um, 
I just, uh, I think silver has a much better appearance than this. So I, I think it's chrome. I really do. It might have been an option that was sold to a particular power company. See, back in those days, electric companies were your appliance distributors. Electric fans, toasters, lamps. You typically buy them from the power company. They would sell you the electricity and they would rent you the appliance or sell you the appliance, depending on the agreement. So maybe there was a version of this that was done in Chrome. It's hard to say. More research needs to be done, I should say. I should say that much. It's a cool little toaster. It does work. Um, it's dangerous as all hell, but <laughs> it is neat. I like how the handles are still intact. They're not broken. Um, I kind of expected that to have happened, but it didn't. And now that it's cooled down a little, yeah, it's cooled down enough so I can handle it. Take a look at the bottom side here. And there's the data plate. It was pointed out to me in a previous video that uh, this toaster is somewhere around 350 watts. I may have said that already, but I don't know. Uh, patent February 6, 1986. Yeah, so who knows. I want to say that that would be 1906 or 19... Hell, even 1926, but 1986? It's obviously somebody sleeping at the typesetter. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's move on to the repair video. And uh, this is the first antique toaster I have ever owned. So I made a lot of uh, learning opportunities. We'll call it that. What's this go to? Oh, right, that's for the radio. That's coming up soon. I hope. Um, the gentleman who's working on that radio for me, by the way, uh, the old Philco, uh, B. Anderson TV. You can see the uh, the progress that he's making on it. And um, let me say, he is he is top notch. The guy knows what he's doing, doing a great job. But that's not what we're walking. Or that's not what we're working on right now. Let's get this toaster uh, video footage rolling, and I'll shut up. Okay, guys. Uh, today we're going to look at this toaster. Um, this is the one I used in the Great Toaster Race. And uh, I want to try to clean it up a little bit. And um, I'm going to do something about these wires. These vertical wires are used to hold the bread in place and keep the bread from contacting the elements. However, they're very badly rusted. And uh, I want to see, I want to take them out and measure the original thickness. See if I can't find something to replace them with. The top of this toaster is held in by a long bolt or screw. And uh, it could definitely use a good cleaning. The rest of the toaster is assembled uh, in, a, in a manner that makes it nearly impossible to, to disassemble. Cleanly. Looks like oh, looks like it actually comes out like that. All right. I see what they did there. So the toasting mechanism can be slid vertically out of this little frame. Uh -huh, okay. This will make repairs easy. I hope. <laughs> these apart. There we go. Oh, 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 oh. It just fell apart on me. Looks like we have to do some work here. This spring is, uh, this needs to be replaced. This spring is in really bad shape. It looks like someone was in here before and, and messed around with it, um, which I, I'm not too happy with, but when you buy something like this, you got to kind of prepare for the worst. So this is all going to make this easy to clean. It's pretty, uh, pretty grimy. These are those wires I was talking about. But take a look at this, uh, this element board, and uh, yeah, these just pop right out like that. Looks like there's two missing. The outer ones, one missing there, one missing there. So it's only a, ma it's only a, yeah. Look at that. This one's rusted almost all the way through. 
Someone's dead. Ooh, ooh, that one broke. This toaster has seen a lot of use. Oh my God! Look at this one. There's like nothing left to it. And these are these are clearly bad. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna try to find some stainless steel wire or a couple of bicycle spokes. But first, we have to take a good unrusty end and measure it for thickness. So I'm gonna have to pick up my um, to grab my uh, which am a jigger. My um, micrometer. This has ribbon elements and I think that is indicative uh, of a later model. Um, I think the very earliest ones featured elements that were made of um, uh, a heavier, a thicker gauge nichrome wire. But I don't know for sure. So we have our work cut out for us on this one. It's going to need a little bit of work. Um, these elements, by the way, can be rewound. So if this toaster had burned out, it wouldn't take much to, uh, to buy a spool of nichrome wire and rewind the element boards um, to make it functional again. In fact, that may have already been done on this particular toaster. You can even remake these boards uh, fairly easily. No, not really easily, but it, it is doable. Um, so, yeah, there's that. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off. I'm going to get a thickness measurement on these. These, these, are, these are in really bad shape. But we're going to get a thickness measurement on those. I've got to grab my, um, my digital micrometer, or vernier. What I'm doing now is I'm making new uh, stakes, and these are uh, what hold the bread away from the elements. And um, as we covered earlier, the original stakes were completely rotted away, they're falling apart, this one broke in half, just getting it out of the toaster. The rust is so bad. Now I've determined that this is more than likely uh, either plated steel, either galvanized or um, some other metal plating. And we're missing two of them. There should be ten, and there's actually eight. And uh, I got the original measurements. They're approximately four and a half inches tall by half an inch wide on the out on the outside. And I went and I, I bought some wire. This is galvanized steel 18 gauge wire. They should be um, I should have used like a 14 gauge. This is, uh, the originals were 60 thousandths. This is somewhere around um, probably uh, 30 thousandths thick. So, anyway. Or do I have that backwards? Eh, it doesn't matter. Um, it's a little thinner, not as stiff as the original wire, but I didn't want to go crazy trying to make, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, sell this thing in an antique shop anytime soon. Um, I mean, if at any point in time somebody wants to replace these stakes with the proper thickness, have at it. Um, I'm just not planning on going that crazy. Um, so, that's pretty much that. I'm basically eyeballing these measurements. I'm not, uh, Terribly concerned with precision. I mean, neither were they in 1915, so I guess yeah, that pretty much takes care of that. But I've made a couple of them already, and it looks like they're working. They're, they fit just fine. Um, they're stiff enough to keep the bread away from the elements, which is what their job is anyway. But that's basically how I make one. I hope I got that on camera. <laughs> Real simple, but and then I just try to straighten the wire out as best I can. It's a coiled steel, so that's about what we're trying to do. So I got one, two, three, four. I got five made, so we're halfway there. I need to make five more. 
So I'll do another one on camera so you can see how it's done or how I'm doing it. Um, I would have preferred um, a straight wire that isn't coiled up like this. It's easier to work with, but I would have preferred something thicker, but you know, you can't always get what you want, right? I was actually going to use stainless steel bicycle spokes, but I think they would be too thick. So, again, I just measure out four and a half inches, pinch it with my finger, or mark it with my fingernail, grab my Leatherman tool, and bend it right at that mark. Go back to the wire with the ruler, measure out half an inch. The original ones would have been made a, a more than likely on a press. Um, it would have had the shape on a die, and they would have just pressed the wire, like, you know, cut some, stamp some all at the same time. They actually did have that kind of technology in 1915. This one came out a bit wide. Into the reject pile it goes. It has to be half an inch uh, wide on the outer um, on the outer surface so that it fits nicely in the holes on the toaster. So yeah, I've got a little bit of waste going on. And again, I'm half, you know, it's getting late. I've had a long day, and I'm just doing this before I go to bed, just to get it done. Because I need to make room for other projects, you know. When you're doing all kinds of different things at once, it, it just makes a mess out of the whole house, and I'm tired of it. So, you know, it's just the way it goes. But so we're gonna cut. It. Fold it right there. Let me just double check that. Yeah. Right, that's where I want my fold. There we go. That's unit number six. If I worked in this toaster factory, I'd be fired right now. Like, yeah, you know, we just can't employ you. Yeah, you're too slow. Yeah, those measurements just aren't right. How'd we do? Perfect. Perfect. That'll do the job. Six. Seven. Oh, wait, that one back there? Oh, that's one of my old rejects. Yeah. I could save the wire and use it for something else, but I'll never use it. So just kind of go like that to straighten it. Ain't perfect, but it does the job. Okay, now we've got ten brand new steaks. And we're going to slide them into the toaster frame. Okay, we'll have to figure out something better. screwdriver here and just fold them in. Okay, we've got all of our stakes installed and I folded the ends over. It's not pretty, but it'll do the job. Um, okay, we now need to put in the drop side. Um, and I just remembered one of the springs is damaged. One of these doors. And that could be a bit of a showstopper for us. 
All right, I got the doors back in. Now, here's what I ended up doing. Um, I figured out how the springs are supposed to go, and it turns out I was pretty much right anyway. Um, this is the original spring. Unfortunately, the original spring on the other side must have broken years ago and was replaced with something a little less uh, trustworthy, but it does the job. I'm not happy with it. But hey, it's a toaster. Who gives a shit? Anyway, um... <laughs> Alright, that's not exactly true. I care, but you know what? I'll, uh, I'll have to... <clears throat> I'll have to try to find a spring that'll be more suitable for the job. Um, I may have to customize... Um, an existing one. I actually, uh, I went to, um... Uh, toastersprings.com Unfortunately, the site doesn't exist. So there goes that theory. But now we're going to slide in the bolt that holds the whole shoot and match together. And uh, apparently that one's a little difficult to guide through, isn't it? So, really now? Let's see if I can look in there and see where the, the other end of this screw is. Okay, oh, I just saw the end of the bolt. I'm just trying to guide it into this blind hole here. That's always fun. Almost there. Almost, oh. I lost it. Come on now. Come on. Almost there. Really now? Just, there we go. Ah, got it. Now, oh, oh, there's a nut. Okay. All done. Well, you know what? If nothing else, we didn't really do the finish any justice, but we did fix all the rusted slats or stakes. And it still um, it still makes toast, so. I don't have any bread, so I can't try it out, but I can heat it up, and uh, that's what we'll do. Um, what the hell, let's do it. So, as always, I'm gonna plug in the toaster first for safety see what she does. I want to burn off any, uh, ooh, that's, that sounds wonderful. Um, I want to burn off any, uh, uh, oils that might be on those, um, galvanized rods. As it heats up, the, um, the mica sheets actually are crackling, which is pretty typical of antique toasters, so it's nothing I'm alarmed, alarmed about. So, throw the old steaks away. This thing is generating heat like a pro. Thanks for watching.